come back from a short break to the next focused session on charging on of commercial fleets. Because in the past years, we've really seen a quick development when it comes to electric uh, light and heavy duty trucks. So that makes it increasingly possible to char um, electrify your commercial fleets. But then questions pop up like what type of charging infrastructure do trucks and commercial fleets need and what strategies are there for charging and optimized charging with regards to time and cost and convenience. And we will now hear three different perspectives on these questions. And we will start with a company from Norway, Flexibility, and we will listen to the CEO Lars Holmefjord, who will talk about their solution, um, which uses AI to maximize efficiency and ra range of charging while minimizing costs. So welcome up on stage, Lars. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Lars Holmefjord, and I am the founder of Flexibility. We build the next generation of smart charging for electric fleets. Today, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about a pilot that we're doing with a Norwegian postal service who has about 3,000 vehicles and thousands of them are electric. I have previous about 15 years with experience with development of decision support and daily energy management for Statcraft. Now we are looking into the future and we believe that our new logic will help many new electric fleets the next 20 years. So let's start and look into Posten and uh, uh, their needs. What do they need for their fleet? Uh, Posten is one of the biggest fleet owners in the Nordics, owning several companies providing logistics in the Nordics and in some European countries as well. They operate 3,000 vehicles, and they're planning to go fully electric within a few years. So it's important for them to find a good cost-effective solution. Together, we are doing pilot focusing on cost and environmental footprint. Posten use a lot of small electric vans, bringing mail to people, and they have hundreds of small vans, electric vans and trucks bringing cargo to clients. They're also planning to electrify the heavy electric uh, or the heavy trucks to electric uh, EVs. We need to have our software that are supporting solar production, battery system, and uh, charging while driving. Before we started the pilot with Posten, we looked into how are Posten charging their fleet today. And what we found is that it's not optimal when it comes to costs, grid uh, 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 peak load, and uh, the environmental footprint. Typical, they are starting charging around 3 p.m. and ends 9 p.m. in the evening. This is not optimal, and we want to change this. Uh, so looking into uh, what kind of output we can get from our software. When a driver is plugging the cable into the car, it triggers our artificial intelligence that is uh, supervising and managing the whole fleet in the terminal. From, uh, we are able to support more than 150 models of vehicles, and we see that we can increase the lifespan of the batteries. This is important for Boston. We look into making the charging more uh, efficient and in, uh, decreasing the uh, environmental footprint. Uh, at the same time, our logic can cut uh, grid fee and energy costs. It's important to get a smaller peak load and utilize the charger and the pro-grid better than today. Uh, it's also important to have an open system so Posten can buy good quality chargers uh, and not be in, being locked into one manufacturer of chargers. Looking into the technical system, uh, at the left side you can see that we are supporting DC chargers and AC chargers. We connect uh, these chargers to our 
backend, and we also connect each vertical in the in their fleet, either through API from the OEMs or via hardware that we provide. Uh, at the right side, you can see that Posen get like a platform where they can monitor their uh, fleet and their charges, and they have the possibility to pro to provide an internal app to their uh, drivers. Our uh, kernel is uh, fetching all needed data, so they don't need to fetch the, the, the data. So it's important to get trading data, uh, data from the power market and the grid to optimize the process. When it comes to the dashboard, we are providing like a plug and play dashboard where people can analyze historical data years back or what is happening the last second. It's also important for person to look into the future and see what is their charging needs. It's important also because the vehicles are a bit more expensive than like diesel uh, trucks and vehicles. Uh, it's important to look into how to extend the battery lifespan. Uh, and this is our logic uh, working with continuously. So we are improving how the OEM are able to uh, extend the battery lifespan. Uh, to wrap it up, uh, environmentally, it's important to uh, save energy and it's also good for uh, the costs. It's also important to extend the battery lifetime, uh, improve the CO2 footprint of your fleet and save costs so your fleet is more competitive. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think that was the last slide. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lars, and really interesting to hear your experiences based on a company like Posten in Norge who has electrified such a, a large share of its fleet already. Uh, and I'm sure we will have many questions for you later in the panel discussion, but for now we will move over to Sweden um, and to Johan Klintberg, who is head of operations at Novolip, a Swedish company that among other things that you will tell you about uh, is investigating a platform solution for shared uh, um, charging infrastructure for commercial fleets. So welcome, Johan. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Johanna. Yes, uh, I will. I will start with uh, just a quick brief uh, of the company, uh, give you a view of the, the challenges as we have seen them in in this uh, case study. But I will uh, just give a short presentation of and also. Uh, give you some of the findings and the, the, the work ahead that we look forward to uh, continue with. So starting with the company, we, we, we are a company with a mission to facilitate the green transformation of the transport industry. And uh, what we do in our daily lives is helping companies uh, to, to navigate through their electric, uh, electrification journey. And uh, to our help to, to be able to do that, we provide electric light commercial vehicles, uh, with a modular architecture uh, that we are realizing through means of converting both new and uh, used vehicles. Uh, together with that, we provide a smart software, which is an enabler for the efficiencies that we want to reach. And, and that is realized through IoT technology and, of course, data collection and uh, analysis. On top of that, uh, our offering also include EV fleet as a services for customers with very large fleets. Um, so, so that was the, the sort of short end of the company. Uh, going forward then to the challenge, we, we all are aware of the climate change that we're facing now. And uh, we all know that we have to change and do things in a different ways going forward if we are going to continue to live on this planet. Uh, for the transport industry, that change is substantial. And uh, we here in this call all know that the, the change has started already, but there are challenges ahead. And uh, what we have found so far is that also uh, seen from the presentations earlier today, the high prices of the electric uh, light commercial vehicles mentioned in the UK, uh, the difficulties with charging mentioned from Norway. We have several challenges. And what we are seeing is that there aren't enough electric vehicles uh, in the market today, not with the price levels and not matching the needs of the customers that we are talking to. 
Secondly, the charging availability is a major obstacle and it provides uncertainty and planning complexity for our customers. Opportunistic charging is not an option if you have deliverables to do and if you have uh, different conditions for your, your uh, goods as well that you need to live up to. And if, if we look at the fleet owners of the large uh, transport fleets, the sustainable transition is very complex. It involves a number of new el elements for consideration that has an effect on the range and that uh, tends to present itself to a problem. So what we have done is uh, we've done a pre-study uh, where we faced with this complexity. We worked with a set of customers and partners to address some of the challenges related to this uh, charging infrastructure side. And what we wanted to see was to, uh, if the collaboration between different companies sharing charging infrastructure was possible. And also, if that then it was possible, uh, is, is it actually presenting itself with cost savings that could accelerate the electrification? And in addition, we also included an element of uh, modular battery strategy in order to, to actually realize a lower overall CO2 uh, emission. And, uh, and together with that, of course, the lower investments in the vehicle fleet. And uh, this study was then partly financed through the Swedish Agency of Innovation, Vinova. Uh, what, what you see here on this slide is a very, I'm afraid, very, very simplified view of uh, some of our findings. Uh, and here uh, we see delivery destinations in the area of Stockholm in Sweden uh, for the participating companies. And uh, uh, what we see here is that the deliverables uh, marked with green was uh, uh, deliverables that was possible to be made with only one battery module. And battery module in our case here is 35 kilowatt hours. And um, moving out, out of the city center, uh, we have destinations available to reach with two batteries. And then the areas of Västerås, Uppsala and the eastern outskirts of the city, it, it was difficult to handle with two batteries. So there you have a, a 19% of the, the, the the, the transport was only made, made possible if you had three batteries in your vehicle. So by introducing charge, uh, shared charging infrastructure, uh, we could actually compile a completely different picture. Uh, for these companies having the sort of combination of delivery points, it was possible to actually use shared infrastructure in these places. And the interesting thing that you find in this picture is that all of a sudden you have um, sort of reduced the number of transports that you require an investment in free battery per, per car. And that in itself is a substantial uh, saving for the fleet owner. Uh, then again, uh, this is only half of the story, of course, since you can do different with the data available you have from the cars and with the limitations in your fleet, you can optimize your planning further and then get, get savings that are much higher than we have illustrated in this picture. So all in all, there are several benefits that can be reached uh, through a shared charging infrastructure. And it's clear that the investments uh, for ed electrification can be trimmed down with good planning and of course, good access to data. And what we also found out was even though initially reluctant, uh, companies are interested in, in the notion of sharing, uh, likely propelled by we're using sharing platforms in our daily lives in our connected society. Uh, however, as we have seen already earlier today and what we have found, there are a number of large challenges that we need to address in order to make this happen. So our ambition is to continue the research and move into a pilot project in the near future. Uh, trying to address the points of security of supply when it comes to energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan. And I think really interesting with your reflection, re reflection on sharing, which uh, we do with more and more resources in society um, now. And we will move on to the next presenter um, from the UK. And we have Paige Mullen, European Program Manager at Novi, 
um, that provides vehicle to grid and aggregation for, among other things, uh, commercial fleets, including car spans and buses. Welcome, Paige. Paige, you are muted, so you need to unmute yourself. Jeez. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Is that back? Right. Everyone. Uh, Sanofi is, um, bridges the gap between the transportation and the electric industry. We focus on vehicle to grid, but also aggregating fleets in a variety of different ways with um, electric vehicles and tapping in stationary batteries as well. Um, we've been working on vehicle to grid since 1996 um, with the patented concept of vehicle to grid out of the University of Delaware. Um, we now operate um, across the world in a lot of different markets and we're headquartered out of San Diego, California. Um, we also have a joint venture with EDF called DREE uh, that helps commercialize B2G technology in Europe. Nuve has been working on vehicle to grid now for over 25 years, uh, specifically looking at fleets and how do you electrify fleets in order to balance out wind and other sources of uh, intermittent generation, but also lowering the total cost of ownership for fleets. Um, right now we have over 350 sites of installations, um, a lot of that being school buses in the US. Uh, we really focus on return to depot fleets and have now been running commercial vehicle to grid in Denmark for over five years. So providing frequency regulation every evening and on the weekends when these vehicles come back from the daily drives. Um, although we do operate on around five continents around the world, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically on the UK as well as some of our Nordic operations. Uh, just look at how those are developing in these markets. Um, I know we have a section on vehicle to grid, but I figured I'd just do a quick overview. Um, so we look at how we can make best use of an asset by either creating savings through smart charging or additional revenues through grid services. Um, we do this through Nuvi's patented aggregation platform called Give Grid Integrated Vehicles that allows the vehicle to charge, but also discharge uh, based off of a variety of different signals from power generation, transmission, local DSO constraints, um, as well as the customer's on-site constraints such as on-site solar, batteries, and their energy tariffs. Um, by pulling all of this in, this lowers the total cost of ownership, uh, making it cheaper for fleets to operate their vehicles, but also giving them the confidence that they know if they set in, in the app or in the web platform that their vehicle is going to be charged for at 7 a.m. with 90% battery, that that's what they're going to get to do their drive. Um, that vehicle to grid makes better use of this asset when it's parked, but they can always override this um, for the purposes of driving. Um, one of our sites that we've been running now is in Denmark, um, and this one's been running now for over five years of continuous operation. And we've expanded this site and added more chargers with more vehicles that this customer has. Um, on general, um, these sites are generating around $2,000 per car per year in by providing vehicle to grid. So this allows for um, this fleet and some of our other fleets to potentially drive for free. Um, this really lowers their operating cost of switching to electric, bringing that ROI a little bit closer and a little faster um, for them to make better use of these assets um, that they've already chosen to electrify. And it's not just in Denmark, but we run uh, V2G in um, pretty much all over the world. Uh, but again, looking primarily at return to depot fleet. So whether that's school buses in the US, which you can see here some of these big yellow buses, um, to emergency power backup and Nissan Leafs running in Namibia with UNDP, to delivery vans coming and going every day here in, De in the UK. And each site is very different, but also each country and each market has their different hurdles that they go into. Um, one of the things that I was uh, very happy to hear Josie mentioned earlier, that is one of the big barriers we face in the UK is these high grid connection costs. And that's something that we actually see vehicle to grid as a way we can help lower those costs and those barriers to electrifying. Um, and that by looking at a fleet base, um, particularly large fleets that are um, having multiple buses, um, whether that's school buses or city buses, delivery trucks, um, or just a large fleet of vans on it is that these are huge sources of power 
plugged in and that we can form a virtual power plant by aggregating these specifically in an individual location, um, especially for a business that is looking to electrify. A lot of times this does have a very high upfront cost for electrification since these typical depots may just have lights, a small on-site facility, um, but maybe doesn't have the huge source of power that's actually needed to power all of these buses or vehicles. Um, and that's where Nuvi system can come in and look at with these vehicles, how can we optimize and aggregate what's on that site, but also how can we bid these into other services in the form of a virtual power plant or local service flexibility services to the local network operators or optimizing off of CO2 in order to achieve net zero faster while also lowering the operating costs for these vehicles and for these fleets. And so when we look at this and kind of the, the transition that's starting to happen as we're moving towards heavy duty mixed use, and um, as was just mentioned, sort of this sharing concept is this idea of a V2G hub and that by leveraging a lot of different assets on one site and matching up different utilization patterns with different services of solar, of battery, of grid services that we can do with these vehicles, um, we can really make much better use of them when they're parked and turning them into these power plants that lower the ownership cost for fleets, so helping them electrify sooner, um, but also allowing us to achieve net zero by helping these vehicles be an active participant into the energy market and really contributing and lowering those network costs um, or alleviating um, the balancing that needs to occur with renewable generation. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons that Nuvi has launched Levo, which is a joint venture um, aimed at helping finance, putting in a turnkey solution for fleets to help put in the infrastructure, help manage that grid connection cost, um, as well as even potentially buying the vehicles and the charging infrastructure to really look at this holistically and how can we finance this off with greater revenue so we can get more fleets electrified sooner and helping us achieve net zero in a, in a much quicker way. And we really see in the UK as well that about six out of 10 new vehicles are fleet vehicles. There are purchased for businesses. And so, and they typically replace those every five years. So that transition is happening very quickly, especially with councils and municipalities in needing to transfer over to electric. And so by helping finance these fleet solutions in a complete package, um, we can get more of these companies um, into electric vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Paige. Uh, really interesting to um, hear your experiences from the UK, but also from all over the world. And um, with that, I'm actually going to invite the two other panelists or the two other speakers onto, back onto stage for some questions. Lars and Yuan, welcome. So I'm a little bit curious, you, you, you touched upon it in your presentations, but I'm a little bit curious about what the most sort of pressing challenges are in the short time to electrify commercial fleets. Uh, so perhaps directing the question first to you, Lars, or maybe rephrasing it uh, in the way that what would what's needed or what's most needed for, for example, Posten's 2000 other vehicles to be converted to uh, or not converted, but to be electrified. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're waiting on the heavy trucks to get electrified. So it's more like Volvo, Scania and uh, the other OEM who needs to produce the, the vehicles first. So that's like maybe like the first thing that needs to happen. Uh, and then they will buy the, uh, I'm quite sure that they will test different models and yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a cost issue also. So like electrifying your fleet is quite costly. So uh, uh, European fleet owner needs to know that they will pay a bit extra, but, and that's why they need like software like ours or other to keep uh, the cost down. So. Uh, like they need to, uh, yeah, it will be a bit costly to con con convert, but like Posten is one of the first mover in the, in the game, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And just as you said, this is what you all have been talking about, how your different solutions can address, uh, among other things, this question of cost. Uh, so Paige, you of course brought up the grid connection, which we, we, we know is an important thing all over the world, but, but are there any other um important challenges that would you would like to lift based on your experiences in the uk or globally yeah 
think uh, the UK has, um, I think we've touched on kind of the idea of international standards and really trying to get for vehicles, for hardware. And I think that's one that in the UK, especially for vehicle to grid or large fleets, it's the time for that connection cost. Especially when looking at a fleet compared to a residential is a fleet, once you've purchased that vehicle, it needs to start go doing its daily rounds. It needs to have a clear path on when you'll be able to install, whether it's a vehicle to grid charger or just a normal charging station in these depots. And that's something I think that Josie mentioned is starting to be addressed in the UK just as we are electrifying, but still for fleets is a big challenge in that is making sure you can time that correctly. So once you do have your vehicles um, all delivered to your depot that you're able to charge them right away so you can just get right back up and start going again. So I think that is a challenge that we're still working on addressing here, um, but is definitely still a, a challenge that we face. Mm, thank you. And Johan, would you like to add some perspectives from, from Sweden? Uh, anything to add um, to what Paige and Lars has brought up? I, I think we're, we're all, always uh, trying to, to, to sort of look at the, the, the simple uh, si simple ways uh, to solve the problem. And, and in this particular case, I think the, the paradigm shift going from fossil fuels to electricity involves so much more that we sometimes take for granted. But just the, the sheer notion of how the drivers should behave and how they should drive in order to conserve the energy as much as possible to get the economies out of uh, the, the, the sort of um, the consumption as well. Uh, I, I think some of those elements are getting intertwined with everything else that we have talked about. So, so it's a fairly complex problem, but uh, I think we have several interesting companies presenting here today that could solve different pieces of the puzzle. And I think the, the, the joined up thinking will, will probably provide the, the sort of the, the very good result that we all want to see going forward. Yeah. And a follow-up question to you, uh, Johan, because Lars mentioned, of course, availability of electrified models is really important. And you mentioned converting. How, how important do you think converting will be in the short term and in the long term, perhaps? I, I think if, if, if we uh, want to walk the talk and, and actually deliver on the climate uh, challenges we have, uh, it, it takes too long to actually exchange the fleets of, of vehicles we have available today. We've, we've heard it from, from several presentations today. Uh, so, so I think conversion will have to be a significant significant part of the puzzle if we are going to to uh, sort of change the way we, we are using vehicles uh, in our society. Mm -hmm. And a little bit picking up on what you mentioned about the driver's experience, for example. Um, Lars, how do you think that suppliers or buyers of logistics need to work or think differently when their fleets are electrified? Um, yeah, some of the cars will drive or they will try to keep the car drive more. Like if, uh, if you buy like an expensive electric vehicle, you need to drive, uh, like get it to be used more than like a diesel uh, variable to like keep uh, keep keep the cost down. So I think it they need some kind of decision support or some kind of system around. So you need like uh, I think it, it's it's a bit more advanced. Like uh, the future will be a bit more like software based. So they need uh, they have uh, tools for logistic planning, but they need to have a system for planning the whole terminal and the whole uh, logistic and integrate it with the cars. So that is what we are looking into. So if you have like uh, a pro software that is deciding where the diesel uh, truck should drive, then the next generation will be much more complex because you need to handle other aspects. Um, mm. So, uh, and uh, that is what we're trying to provide. And, and uh, um, moving on to you, Paige, when, as Lars is mentioning, when the um, cars might need to be driven more hours of the of the day, um, how does that impact uh, the potential for different grid services? Have you looked at that? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, definitely one of the big considerations. With vehicle to grid, for most services, it will depend on either what time of day that vehicle is parked or how long that vehicle is parked, depending on the different services you might be providing in different markets. Again, each market is going to have different high value services that you'd look at. And that's when 
way that we see this hub concept coming in is when you have such a mixed use of that, that some vehicles will need to be parked at different periods and you can really stack all of those different utilization periods. And again, with vehicle to grid, it shouldn't be asking a fleet to change their behavior, but finding what we can do within the pattern that they already have. And again, it may not work for every exact pattern if it needs to be driving continuously. Um, but then in that sense, maybe you've got other vehicles that are parked on that site or an extra battery that you're leveraging and optimizing off of in order to charge those. So that is one area where electrifying fleets is every fleet is very different. And so it mm -hmm. does require you looking at each fleet, where it's positioned, what else is on the network in that area that you can be able to provide that service for. So it's hard to speak in general for all fleets around the world, just since they are so different. Mm -hmm. But that definitely is something that we absolutely take into account for that is, is the driver's needs in order to do their business. They bought, bought these vehicles for an initial purpose and vehicle to grid has helped making that use case better and bringing the total cost of ownership down for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I know that might be a hard question to answer, but do you have any general um, conclusions or takeaways about the potential of providing grid services for, for example, school buses as you worked with or delivery vans or perhaps other commercial vehicles mm -hmm. like taxis? Do you have any conclusions on that or takeaways? Yeah, so I think school buses is a really exciting one um, from an electrification standpoint. Obviously, that's a little bit more U.S. based uh, just from school bus, the nature of school buses. Um, but in the U.S., most of the U.S., specifically California, their peak periods is in the middle of the summer. And if you think of the utilization of a school bus, it drives just to school in the morning, picks up kids, drops them off, and then in the afternoon takes them home. So it's parked during the middle of the day and then all summer during the peak period. So it's but it's also a very large battery that's needed in order to move that. So, and they'll all park at a very large bus depot. And so from an optimization, and when we talk about the use cycles of those, there's a really great opportunity for those because of the times that they're parked and the duration that they're parked. So that's really where we see a lot of value in them. Um, and then as you start to layer in resi grid resiliency, emergency power backup, being able to drive these buses and provide that backup if you require a power shutoff like we've seen in California or the grids um, failing in Texas, that there's other ways you can provide that backup with these, these vehicles, again, depending on the utilization. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of them that we've seen, such as our fleets in Denmark and the UK, is they're typically, because of the types of vehicles we have that's been mentioned, they're your Nissan Leafs, your Nissan EMV 200s, uh, just since those are the commercially available um, vehicle to grid vehicles through the Chatham standard right now, um, although more are coming out. And they typically leave every morning around the same time, 7, 8 a.m., will do their drive, and then they're back around 5 or 6 o'clock at night. And so they're able to provide those services throughout the evening and recharge up when there's typically more wind um, on the network. So then it's charging up um, lower periods of carbon intensity. Yeah. Thank you. And I've seen, I'm going to have some questions from the chat here uh, but i've seen both you and Lars nodding anything you want to to add on what what page was uh, uh, yeah i can add like as a fleet owner you should get like access to the vertical data ask for that when you buy a vertical that's important for all fleet owners so before you buy the vertical ask if you can get access to data uh, without data you don't uh, or you're not uh, able to manage your fleet in a good manner. So, like when we electrify uh, a fleet, uh, please ask for access to data. So, like the OM should be able to provide data from uh, to uh, fleet owners. Uh, and if you don't get that, it's very difficult to manage your fleet in a good way. So you need like battery status, temperature of the battery, and data like that. So then you can get uh, good solutions providing. Uh, uh, decision support for, for your fleet. But without that kind of access, you are struggling. Yeah. That's perfect, Lars. That's actually a question that I sat with uh, about access to data. So you answered it before I could ask it. What about you, Juan? So no, it, it's very true. Uh, data is uh, the key to a lot of those things. And in order to realize the benefits that Paige are talking about as well, it, it's important that, that you know and make good use of your data. Otherwise, it's it sort of it, it's just another dumb vehicle. So, mm. so uh, uh, we need to get smarter and, and uh, also utilizing the, the, the scarce uh, availability of power as well. So, 
Thank you. So I'm going to see if I have some questions from the audience here. Um, let's see, from Keith Budden, a question about uh, grid upgrades, I think. Uh, the key challenge, as I see it, as Keith sees it, is uh, as to who pays for the grid upgrades required at depots for commercial vehicles. Uh, many of these depots are on short-term rents, too. So who should pay? The van operator, the land over, la landowner, or the taxpayer, or perhaps even the depot owner? Do you have any perspectives on, on this question, any of you? I think it depends if you, if you actually need to... to... Uh, how you are going to use a vehicle to grid type of solutions you, you can use that in your own business as well and then th that gets into another regulation story at least in the Nordics uh, on, on how that is allowed to to uh, be able to to reuse electricity in different ways from uh, a fleet that you have that, that are standing idling uh, during day for instance so, so sometimes you, you, you don't have that much of in investment However, should you use it in the grid, then of course uh, we, we talk about heavy investments and uh, uh, that, that's probably uh, leaning towards the, the operator rather than uh, uh, taxpayers and landowners, I guess. I could maybe try to, yeah, so this is an issue that we look at and in, in Norway, uh, like the one that asks for more uh, connection uh, access will need to pay if it, it's needed to be in, uh, invested. So they need to pay, pay their share of the connection. So, and it can be quite costly. So for example, if a terminal node use about one meg, meg, megawatt and we need to upgrade to four megawatt, it will be uh, a lot of money going only to upgrading the grid outside of the ter ter terminal. So that's an important part of uh, using decision tools to find out how much do you actually need to upgrade. Is mm. it, uh, is it, uh, um, and uh, also looking in, into battery system, if it's uh, economical to just keep a battery in, in the term term terminal. And that, uh, in Norway, it's very cheap to get like connection to grid. So normally we we just connect and we get like the access that we need so it's a quite strong power grid but uh, in uk maybe you need more batteries i will assume uh, yeah. and i think off of that as well it's looking at the batteries on the site or other things that you could put in and i think a big one too that josie sort of mentioned in in her talk i think at the beginning which i think really set the scene for this question is starting to look at pricing upgrades for what's actually needed, not always necessarily going in with the worst possible situation, but how can we look at other forms of local flexibility that maybe mm -hmm. instead of adding a cost, this can actually alleviate a congestion and allow for more EVs or more solar to come onto that DNO's network. And I think that's a big shift we're starting to see in the UK as we're shifting from DNO where it's build out wires to connect this to having to build in that flexibility and look at this more on a holistic level. And so I think that is, I think coming from Keith, I know this is a really big topic that we're seeing in the UK is, and again, who pays for this and how that needs to go. And I think it really comes down to also starting to look at from the DNOs, how are we going to price this? Because I think sometimes we're over building out our networks when we could start putting in fail safe switches, getting other forms of flexibility, especially when we're looking at large depots that are starting to electrify and huge amounts of EVs coming on is we can't just build out the network. We need to build in flexibility. And I think that provides a great opportunity for any form of EV and flexible storage that now you've got other revenue streams you can put in to help now those companies that maybe would have initially been turned off from electrifying purely for a grid cost. But now that's another revenue stream. They can alleviate congestions further down on the network and maybe they're actually able to electrify more. And so I think that's where we can look at EVs as either part of the problem for the cost of the DNOs and the DSOs as they're electrifying, but also as a way we can bring on more flexible assets onto our networks. Mm -hmm. the yeah, and I think that also ties back to uh, what you once said in the end of your presentation about sharing resources. Mm -hmm. to you, to really use the, the electric grid infrastructure that we have in place more efficiently rather than just building more. Although we of course need to do that as well. Our time is running up, but we have one more short question that I 
uh, became a bit curious about myself. Uh, so let's see if anyone yeah. of you have any answer to this. And it's from Sten Vandel. And the question is, does anyone offer ownership of the batteries in commercial vehicles? Have you have any of you heard about such a um, business model? Indirectly, no? if like a fleet owner is uh, leasing the car from like the OEM directly, I would say like you're just borrowing the batteries. Mm. So uh, I think a lot of players are just leasing the vehicles for in average. Average, I think it's five years. So uh, um, yeah, I think we'll start to see more of this as more fleets are electrified and people are looking at more creative business models. So I know there's a few companies that are starting to look at this concept of separating those out, but I think that also requires some buy-in from the OEMs and how the auto manufacturers want to look at that. And that's looking at you know, kind of changing their ownership structure for that. So I think we'll start to see that in the future, but I think there's definitely a need of multiple players to join in on that. But I think right now, the main one, yeah, as, as Lars mentioned, it's leasing for that and how do you underwrite that? battery costs. Thank you, Paige. And we'll have to wrap up there actually to move on to the next point in the program, the networking sessions. But thanks a lot, all of you, for really interesting uh, presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. So we're moving on to networking sessions before we get to lunch. And this uh, point in the program is something that I'm really cu um, excited about. So um, I'm going to show my slide here. Perfect. So this is a point in the program where you will be able to uh, uh, get more interactive and deepen the discussions around the number of topics with each other. Um, so we have 60 different network sessions and four of them are hosted by companies that will lead discussions about a number of really interesting topics. So we have the Norwegian company Current that will lead a discussion around what the critical components are, are for an EV fleet charging management solution. So focusing, focusing on key areas for fleet managers electrifying their fleets. Then we have Vattenfall from Sweden leading a discussion around learnings from the electrification of commercial fleets. Uh, so they would present the five most uh, relevant learnings based on the projects that they've carried out in this, within this field. And then we have Kiel University uh, in the UK that are, uh, will lead a discussion about what the barriers and potential solutions are to providing on-street charging based on a project that they're carrying out together with Innovate UK and Lesla Limited. Uh, and then we have EC, who will lead a discussion about, uh, I think they made a, named it the social divide. How can we ensure public funding provides the infrastructure to the future EV drivers, as opposed to the typical EV driver profile of today? And in this discussion, they will also present an example from charging infrastructure rollout in Amsterdam. Um, and then we will also have two other network sessions or networking rooms where we have more open discussions on uh, the topic access to charging in urban areas uh, and the topic charging of commercial fleets. So the two, two, two topics of this morning. And if we're lucky, the speakers of these two sessions might also pop in in these Q&A sessions and, and might answer some of your questions. So I will now let you know how you get to these networking sessions. So again, wait until I've explained, until you click somewhere. Um, so you access these network sessions by clicking on sessions. And once you do that, you will get to a view that looks something like this, where you will see these different six different network sessions. And you basically just click on the one you'd like to join. Then you will need to click another time on a blue button that uh, asks you to share your video and audio. And in each of these sessions, there's a maximum number of 20 participants to allow discussions to, to work smoothly. So uh, in just a moment, be quick to, to enter the discussion room that you're most keen on joining. And after uh, the networking sessions, we have an hour lunch, uh, and then I'll meet you back here on the stage at 2 p.m. Central Eastern time for more focused sessions. But enjoy discussions and lunch, and I'll see you here in a couple of hours.